Welcome back. Wednesday night. You know what that means? Two wonderful things. One, more than halfway through the week. Thank goodness for that. But two, time for another scintillating segment with one of our own. The gentleman genius, author, broadcaster, extraordinaire, Kel Richards, who joins me now from Sydney. I tell you, mate, you are a favourite. I think people tune in on Wednesday just for you at the end of the show. Perhaps they'd love you every night, but we can't make that happen. Um, I want to ask you about a word that I often get asked about, or really it's a phrase, net zero, because everyone's got it at the, the, you know, the top of the tongue, activists, apparatchiks, everywhere we've heard it. But a lot of viewers say, I want Kel's take on what it actually means. So away we go. OK, well, it is, as you say, the expression dominating Glasgow at the moment. I mean, you walk through the streets of Glasgow, it's just net zero all over the place. So I've been trying to analyse this linguistically as a piece of language to work out what it means. And I've come to the conclusion that the expression net zero works in our language a little bit like the word unicorn. In other words, we can define it, we can say what it means, but we also know it can never actually exist as such. Let me explain why. A couple of steps. I know it's dinner time and you don't want your brain to go too hard, but just look, put on your thinking cap, follow me for a moment here. Uh, the net part of net zero means what is left when you subtract the outgoings and the incoming. So there's a, a certain amount of carbon dioxide going into the air, some being taken out, and when you subtract the two together, that's the net figure. That's the net half of the expression. The zero half means that when you do that sum, you will get a zero. You will get the two sides balancing exactly. In fact, let me read you. This is the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of net zero. It says an overall balance between the amount of carbon dioxide going into the air and the amount being removed from the air. Now, here's the problem. The only mechanism for removing carbon dioxide from the air is plant life. You know, all the plants, including the plants that feed us and forests and that sort of thing. It's called photosynthesis. They breathe in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. So all the carbon dioxide that we produce gets breathed in by these green plants. In fact, uh, American comedian Shelley Berman was famous for saying, uh, you got to remember, no matter how mean or horrible or nasty you've been today, every time you breathed, you made a little plant happy. Because it's that's what they do. They breathe in our carbon dioxide. Now, uh, that's the only mechanism. Now, if we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, there's less carbon dioxide for them to breathe. So that must diminish plant life. That means we have to reduce carbon dioxide further. And if we reduce carbon dioxide further, that will further diminish plant life. So you can never achieve a balance. The zero part of net zero is unachievable. It is this mythical beast. It is what I'm calling the equivalent of a unicorn. So uh, I got a feeling that somehow the people who are so passionate and concerned about this, uh, Greta and all her mates, haven't thought through what it means as a piece of language. It actually means something you can't ever have. Does that make sense? Look, it does to me, and I thought, uh, you know, I've been deep in this issue for well over two decades almost, and... I don't think I've ever heard anyone give the explanation you did about plants. And look, you're absolutely right. I mean, you do year nine science, it'll tell you you're right. That's, I think, the missing part to, to step a lot of people through this because the, the problem with bureaucratic speak, um, and we saw program specificity and all of those words that Rudd had and Malcolm Turnbull had and more, is we lose the authenticity in our language and the communication tool with voters and they just get used to spin and verbiage. And that's what's missing on, I think, a lot of this climate language. You're exactly right. There was a lovely letter in The Australian about a week or so back where a, a lady said, uh, I, my worry is we are living in a place that she called slogan world. If we're living in slogan world, we don't think. All we do is we accept the slogans that get thrown at us. And net zero is one of the slogans being thrown around these days. So the brain never t gets into gear. We never think about, OK, what would net zero mean? It would mean balancing carbon dioxide. Hang on. How does that actually happen? What is the mechanism? Uh, we're actually told by NASA that the amount of forestation in the world is at a record level. Uh, we're not having famines because there is a bit more carbon dioxide in the air. We're getting fabulous plant growth. Well, the opposite has to happen. If we take carbon dioxide out of the air, plant life must diminish. It cannot do otherwise. And John Kerry is not satisfied uh, with, with saying we cut down our carbon dioxide emissions. He's actually said recently, as Joe Biden's spokesman on the subject, we need to find a ways of sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. I mean, they haven't thought 
that there won't be anything left for us to eat if we succeeded in doing that. Net zero is incoherent. It is a mythical beast. It is a unicorn of language. Brilliant as always, Kel. I'll ask uh, my viewers at home if there's any suggestions for next week, any favourite words, etc. send them my way, send them Kel's way. We'll do it all again. Thank you as always. Love to chat to you.